Former New York State Chief Judge Saul Walker famously remarked that a prosecutor could persuade a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. In the Ferguson death of Michael Brown and the Eric Garner case, grand juries chose not to indict. In both cases, the officers testified and were able to convince jurors that what they did was not criminal. So how does the grand jury work? And is it the right way for prosecutors to handle these very controversial cases? Joining us this morning are attorney Paul Martin, who represented one of the officers in the Sean Bell shooting case, and attorney David Schwartz, a former criminal prosecutor in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. Gentlemen, good to have you here with us this morning. Use of the grand jury in high profile cases, is that the way to go, do you think? Well, that's what they're gonna tend to do, unless the, the prosecutor really intends to prosecute the case. Well, how much role does the prosecutor have in determining the outcome of the grand jury? Well, the, the prosecutor has great control over the grand jury, but it's really those 23 jurors that are sitting from the county listening to the cases over and over again. They have the full control of that room. Oh, I beg to differ. I think the prosecutor is the judge and the presenter of evidence and has tremendous control in the outcome of the proceedings. So, um, sometimes I would agree with that, but ultimately it's the grand jurors that make the decision. So in this particular matter, matter, they were provided a lot of evidence and they made the decision, not the prosecutor. But how do you explain that most of the times grand juries do indict, but in cases that involve police officers, they tend not to indict? How do you explain that? Well, it depends on the agenda of the prosecutor. Here in Staten Island, I don't think there was an intention to ever have these officers indicted for these crimes and the same is the situation in Ferguson. In fact, that prosecutor made it clear that he was uh, very close ties to the police department and how he would present the evidence. David? The analysis for me is not whether or not it's a police officer that's being accused, it's the fact that he testified. And when you have a criminal defendant testifying in a case, it changes the dynamics completely. You cannot indict a ham sandwich under those circumstances. When the defense puts in a case there are many times where there's a no true bill. I would say in about half the cases when a defendant testifies in this city, there's a no true bill. But well, we both know, David, that when you present this type of case and a defendant testifies in a grand jury, the prosecution can cross-examine you. And there's a method of cross-examination. They don't get the same cross-examination as our typical defendant in the grand jury. I'm not sure about that, but... Use of a special prosecutor. You've got two state legislators right now proposing a bill saying that there should be a special prosecutor in any case where a police officer is accused or charged or accused of shooting an unarmed person. Do you agree that that should be the case, both of you? I think we're both on the same page. There. Both on yes, the same page I, on I, I completely agree. I think it's an inherent conflict with the DA to, to be prosecuting the person that's a witness on their other cases. There's a conflict well, there. Well, let's talk, because a lot of people are now saying, well, there's a whole conflict with the way the system works, that you've got judges, you've got DAs, you've got grand juries. I mean, they are all really working together with the police department. Is there that kind of collusion going on? Is that your sense? Well, in theory, there's a checks and balances. The judge is to preside over the proceeding. The prosecution is to present their evidence. And, of course, the defense attorney, we both know, have You talk own about roles. it in theory. Is in that theory. happening in practice? Well, in reality, that's just not true. I mean, I think if you go to any criminal courthouse and just watch the proceedings and how they take place, you will definitely get a sense that there are uh, uh, relationships. In, in my career, David? I've gotten that impression. However... It's judge by judge. So you have some excellent judges out there that are a fair arbiter of the facts, and they treat both sides equally, and they treat all the litigants equally. And then you have some bad judges that do favor the prosecution. So it goes both ways. I think we're talking about the criminal justice system in its entirety. And if I think if you look at it in its entirety, you get the sense that uh, there is not the same justice for those who are economically unfortunate or poor and those who are not. In trials, 100% I agree with that. In trials there's change of venue, um, but not a change of venue with grand juries. Should there be? That, I mean, that would be one way to alleviate the problem, but I, I just think special prosecutors is the way to go with, mm -hmm. with this issue. I think it's a no-brainer. Do you think if the grand jury had been in Brooklyn or the Bronx, there would have been a different outcome on this? With the same prosecutor presenting the evidence? I don't think there would have been a different outcome. You don't think so? I, I, I think there would have been a different outcome. Probably one of the charges would have stuck. Let me ask you, I served on a jury once, and I found it to be a great learning experience, but I found that everybody there took it very seriously. You were there every day. You were required to be there. You took it very seriously. I get the sense in reading some of the things about grand juries 
that it's not so much that way. Is it your sense that they take it very seriously? We saw that this grand jury, some people were on their cell phones from time to time, that they weren't always paying attention, perhaps, to the testimony before them. That's been in some accounts in the papers. Do grand juries take their job seriously? Well, th I don't think that they don't take it seriously. The atmosphere is definitely relaxed. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as a, a pettit jury when you're in a courtroom. But um, I, I, I would hope that they take their responsibility seriously in, e in both forms. I've presented hundreds of cases to grand juries, and what's interesting is each grand jury takes on a personality of its own. So I've seen some more relaxed grand juries, and I've seen some very serious grand juries, but I think they take their job seriously for you the do. most part. Okay. Um, we've also heard questions raised about the secrecy of the proceedings within the grand jury. How do you unveil what's going on within the system so that people can have more transparency? And should there be more transparency in what goes on with grand juries? Well, you, you have to remember in New York, there's not only the grand jury system, but you could have a probable cause hearing. Mm -hmm. So the prosecution could have elected to have a hearing to prove probable cause in this case, in which it would have been clearly public. Uh, they chose to do grand jury because I think they elected to present the evidence in a manner which they don't want to be questioned or second called on how they do it. Okay. We, we okay. hardly ever have probable cause hearings, but that is another solution. You know, the grand jury is a secret process, and we need to preserve the secrecy of the grand jury for a multitude of reasons. Okay. I'm going to have to leave it at that, gentlemen. Thank you so much Thank for you. being on the program. We'll see what changes happen down the road. And that'll do it for this edition of Up Close. If you missed any of today's program, you can catch it again on our website, 7online.com. We want to thank you for watching. I'm Diana Williams. Go out and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Have a good one.